sheep fairs, once a common feature of the Irish countryside, are fast dying out, replaced by marts and factories. But in Carrick, a Donegal village between Killybegs and Glencolum Kill, they still hold the September fair. These sheep are being tied up using hand-woven Sugan straw ropes. Young farmers like Cahal Car from Mina Cannon, Kilcar, mingle with canny sheep dealers, for the business of buying and selling is deadly serious. <laughs> Teeth and bones are critically examined for signs of age or disease. Today we have three and a half million sheep in Ireland, yielding some 20 million pounds of wool each year of which approximately three quarters is exported, though we import almost as much again. A far cry from the early days, when a man might keep a few sheep for his needs, mutton for the table and wool for his back. <laughs> sheep have a long tradition in Ireland. They were probably brought in by the first Neolithic farmers over 5,000 years ago. And there's two on the opposite side there. Three. There's a three. That was again three, three six, three nine, and three is twelve. Okay, twelve. This is the big point. The one lying down now, she's not for sale. Mira, would we give it a wee hush up? Make her, that's it. Uh, make her more proud of herself. She's real pretty. <laughs> She's beautiful. <laughs> Fifteen apiece. You must be joking. Fifteen apiece. <laughs> what did you give me for the sheep, anyway? Well, according to Duncan Ely, Mark, yesterday, Fifteen, didn't you know all the gods? Fifteen. Do what I'll do in, in right words. I'll tell you what, it's too much to give you, but I'll, I'll give you a tenner. No, no good, no good. Well, that's all. Give him for oh, nine. Go on, give him for nine. No way, right. give him for nine. No, you can't. I couldn't do that. No, no. I mean, when you study up this goddamn thing, you, you take them home, and maybe you'll lose two of them overnight. What the hell? Jeez, Jimmy, it couldn't work. The nine and a half. <laughs> nine and a half. No, oh, you, you know you've got a wrong. bounty. You've got a bounty after them, all right. So they're kept on the ear. They have their bangles in you. <laughs> no, no, jeez, I wouldn't. You know, no, no nine and a half about it. No, no way. No. I know they're all females, which is a very good thing. <laughs> Yeah. Come on, are you giving to me at night? No, oh, not a hope. No, no. Well, I can't. Yeah, come here. There, I'll go through that six pound, thirteen a piece. If you want them, and if you don't, you can keep them. Three, I always four. split the difference. That's right. okay. Split the difference. That's right. That was. That's four. twelve a piece. Twelve a piece. Yeah. Come on. That's it. Okay. Take them okay. Time. All right. Mark Thank them you there. Are. Thank you. When the final bargain is made, the last animal sold, there is time to spare and money to spend. Perhaps to buy a new suit of clothes from the travelling tailor. Once the tailor walked from village to village, carrying the tools of his trade, a pair of scissors, a burnt stick for measuring, a flat iron called the tailor's goose. Spending a week in a farmhouse, cutting and stitching, making fine new suits from the wool, spun, dyed and woven by hand, clothes to last a lifetime, durable, weatherproof, warm as the fleece from which they were fashioned. <laughs> All summer long, these hardy mountain sheep have grazed the slopes of Glencolum Kill 
are around Sleeve League, whose fantastic cliffs rise 2,000 feet above the wild Atlantic coast. Now they are going, some for export, more to be kept for breeding, and still more will browse in new pastures until the lambing and shearing seasons come round once more. You know the sheep man when you see him throw in the morning? I think you better. It has to make it a good farm. From mid-June onwards, the sheep are rounded up for shearing. The Carr family are farmers, Frank Carr and his wife, and their son Cahill, who now runs the farm. Mrs Carr still cards and spins in the old traditional way. Cahill breeds the hardy black-faced Scotch yews with the curly horns, which have long been a feature of the Donegal scene. <coughs> shearing the sheep is a highly skilled job. Methods of shearing and the tools used have changed little over the centuries. The sheep shears, or jivis as it is called in Irish, that Cahill is using is very similar to one which was excavated in High Street, Dublin, a relic of medieval times. Och, it's very warm. Frank Carr takes a dander up from the new homestead to see how things are going. Sheep and the wool they produce have made Donegal strong since the days when the princely O'Donnells, lords of the fish, held sway. For over 400 years, princes and people withstood Anglo-Norman pressure, remaining prosperous and ruggedly independent, trading wool and homespun clothes to the great medieval shipping centres of Europe. Sheep can be broadly divided into long wools, medium and short wools. The Wicklow Cheviot is a medium wooled sheep, thriving on moderately bleak terrain. The fleece of the Galway Ross common mutton sheep is also of medium length, though of slightly better quality. The land where it thrives is of better quality too. This magnificent Suffolk Down ram is an example of the short wool, breeds which yield a yet finer wool. His fleece, though not yet fully grown, shows the crimping and elastic quality of the wool fibres. It shows clearly in this washed fleece. The mountain blackface fleece is long and coarse and is used mainly for carpet making and blending. Much of this wool is exported to Bradford in England. Mrs Carr uses the wool to knit the socks and jerseys for her family. She does very little separating as she spins most of the fleece.
In Lewisburg, County Mayo, Mrs. Bessie Morrison sorts the fleece into three grades of wool. First, she discards the unkempt edges of the fleece. When the fleece is separated and graded, it gets a rough hand mixing. Then it is washed. Mrs. Morrison washes carefully, pressing the wool gently so that it will not tangle or felt. The soft mayo water is a help. When the wool is dry, it is teased or pricked clean of any briars or sticks. Next, the wool must be greased. Different spinners use different greasing agents. Mrs. Carr sprinkles her wool with vegetable oil, which she gets from the factory in Kilcar. Mrs. Morrison uses paraffin oil. The blending of oil and wool facilitates the carding. In places where oil was scarce, the people used goose grease. After the wool has been sorted, washed, teased and oiled, comes the carding. The carders have fine wire teeth mounted in leather. A handful of fleece is placed between two carders and combed backwards and forwards between the teeth until the tangled fibres lie side by side. Lastly, the fibres are rolled on the back of the carder. Mrs. Morrison in Mayo cards in exactly the same way, though she rolls the wool on the back of a carder by hand. Now the wool is ready for spinning. Mrs. Morrison uses the big wheel, the tournemore. The spindle is driven by a band of wool. It is held in place by woven rush called ears in this district. To start, the wool is wound round the spindle. The wheel is turned, carefully drawing the wool out as it gathers twist. At this crucial point, it is reversed and the end attached to the spindle. The spinner stands in order to work the big wheel, constantly moving backwards and forwards.
When a roll is spun, the next is deftly joined on. The whirling spindle twists the carded wool into yarn. When spun, the section is wound straight onto the spindle. My hoochri, Thor Kanelidu. Eighty-two-year-old Mrs. Kate Mitchell of Dingle, County Kerry, learned to spin at her mother's knee. It is over 40 years since she used the wheel, for the art of spinning has all but died out in the south of Ireland. Spinning to her is a reminder of hard times long past. In this district, the spindle is held in position by two pieces of Sally Willow. The big wheel in Kerry is similar to the big wheel in Mayo, except that the spinner sits. Mrs. Carr uses the small flax wheel driven by a foot pedal. It allows the spinner to use both hands and work faster. The big wheel was also extensively used in Donegal, and it was common to find both types in the same house. In 1796, the linen manufacturers in Ulster distributed 6,000 flax wheels and 60 looms in Donegal alone in a single year to encourage flax growing. Before long, almost every home in Donegal owned its own flax wheel, which of course was used for spinning wool, and this formed the basis of much of the 19th century homespun tweed industry. The small wheel, or tournebeg, changed the social pattern. The girls of a parish carried their wheels to a different house each night and passed the hours together, carding and spinning, storytelling and singing, drinking the odd cup of tea and having a few dances in between when the men were ready to join them. Aye, and many's the match was made at the factory, as they called it. Old country spinners once had a saying, it's best to spin when the sheep are asleep. But night spinning and all the company and the crack and the core that went with it are a thing of the past. Only the occasional solitary spinner like Mrs. Carr, working quietly at home, remains. The flyer evenly distributes the yarn onto the bobbin. Mrs. Carr now re-spins the yarn to make two-ply wool.
In high summer in North Connemara, it is traditionally the children's job to go out after rain to gather the scratloch, the grey lichen that grows on the granite rocks of the area. In Donegal, Mrs. Carr still gathers the cruttle, as it is called locally, for dyeing. It is also a lichen, though a different variety. The Latin name of this lichen is Parmelia saxatilis. Hello, darling. The method used to dye the fleece varies slightly from district to district. In North Connemara, the dye pot is packed with alternate layers of fleece and lichen and left to simmer over the fire. Boiled down with the wool, the lichen gives varying shades ranging from the pale buff of sea foam to the dark red brown of bog oak. Often the dye was fixed with the juice of elder twigs and oak twigs and chips were used to produce a glossy black. The early Irish loved colour. Our legends and tales of long ago are full of accounts of beautifully coloured clothes. Maidens with tunics of purple and green and gold. Red branch knights with cloaks of blue and yellow and crimson. Mrs Mary Coyne waits patiently. Oh, darling. See? It's lovely. See the shades? The yeah. Three different shades we've got now. The natural yeah. one and then the natural. Yeah. yeah. No shop dies here. All these plants yield natural dye stuffs which give vibrant, splendid colours to homespun wools. And the old traditional names linger on. Woad, called glasheen in Irish, used for a blue dye. Crimson, obtained from a plant called rudd or ruin. The roots of water lily dye a dark, rich brown. These skeins of homespun wool are all naturally dyed. The Aran Islands on the western seaboard have long been renowned for their hand knits. Fishermen's ganses in banyan wool, still retaining the natural oils which keep them waterproof. Traditional knitting, however intricate and skilled, has always been purely functional. Gansies or jerseys to keep a body warm, affording as much protection from the weather as a top coat. Socks sturdy, long lasting, knitted from natural wools by patient hands, like Mrs. Carr's. The Carr's reared 13 children in frugal comfort because they were largely self supporting. Shoes and boots made and mended by Mr. Carr, who in his young days was apprenticed to the local shoemaker. The craft of wool and home spinning is vanishing fast the echo of the wheel turning 
and from far away the searching call of the oyster catcher, nitty needle, nitty needle, and the lonely cry of the sheep. 